Are you ready to learn? Because my super experienced guests are ready to share some really valuable information. Make sure and listen all the way to the end to get help and support. So let's start with the best audio experience. Hello, guys. Welcome to our show. Today we discuss about digital transform uh, transformations. It's a very important topic today because it's hard. It's hard. It's not simple because of competition. I remember many years ago, like 10 years ago, I literally, you know, that was hard for me to find any competition. And uh, today it's not like this because of uh, almost everyone online all companies online that's why it's better to find some unique and interesting ways that's why i'm so excited to discuss this topic with patrick ward how are you i'm so good anatoly how are you <laughs> uh i'm doing great we chatted a little bit before the podcast uh, yeah we record this podcast on friday uh probably someone who listened this episode can find another day but uh i will not tell it doesn't matter what kind of day you have just love your job if you hate it leave it and you will never regret <laughs> patrick before we start just tell more about yourself experience background uh and tell why you decided to share this important topic yeah so i am the vp of marketing at rootstrap and digital transformation is literally everything that we do um, specifically, we are a technology consultancy. So obviously, as you said quite rightly before, that digital transformation is no longer a nice to have, it is a necessity. And you can't just do it once. It is a continuous uh, innovation and it is a continuous journey for many organizations. And needless to say, many organizations, depending on their industry, they're not prepared for being truly digitally transformed. Usually they got into business because they really understood their customers or they really understood a particular product or they really understood a particular service. Uh, but how to deliver that product, deliver that service, uh, deliver value to those customers through digital means, uh, that is an ever-changing process. Um, you know, you could have asked someone 10 years ago what that meant and most people would have said, probably means a social media strategy. You ask someone in 2023 what that means, it usually means something involving AI. And so the thing about digital transformation is, while it has been one of these buzzwords that gets thrown around for, for so many different years, it constantly evolves. And, and that's a big part of what I do with Rootstrap is helping companies understand what specifically within the digital realm uh, can be transformative for them and their business. Nice, nice. Love it, love it. You know, I enjoyed your lessons that you share on my uh, SEO course. That was great to learn how to build these links with the help of reporters out. Uh, I enjoyed our first episode, so I'm excited to learn more about digital transform uh, transformation. For me, it's very important. I know it's not simple because uh, I see when companies create generic strategies, they copy their competitors, uh, learn from best practices. That's okay to learn from best practices, but you need to find your way to consider your strong side. And you mentioned about consultancy. Can you tell uh, your way how to teach others, how to consult them about uh, another way of uh, digital transformation? Because, you know, uh, I found that many companies, uh, when you share a lot of tips, insights, what to do, uh, they don't know what to uh, do. And according to some well-known studies, uh, companies usually implement 40% of all recommendations. So 60% ignore. For example, if company, uh, a company pays like uh, $10,000 for uh, consultancy service, 6,000 are <laughs> wasted money. So any tips how to give data, what to do, but uh, to explain importance of doing this? <laughs> Absolutely. I think the key thing to remember here, and I'm going to use the example of AI because it is the, the, the flavor of the month, if you will. So more often than not, what we see with a lot of other consultancies and even a lot of people uh, in the industry, they just continue to talk in these fanciful vision terms of 
five years from now, 10 years from now, like look how transformative AI is going to be for your industry. Look how disruptive it is. And the first question, and obviously the biggest pain that a lot of customers often feel in that it's, but what does that matter to me right now? Like what matters to me in this quarter? And so let's take something like AI. Sure, there are going to be many more expansive, transformative ways to analyze data, predict trends, uh, you know, and those are large scale shifts. The fact of the matter is any large enterprise takes a long time to do anything. And that's just the nature of the institution. You know, when you have a large entity, it's it's kind of like moving a cruise ship. It takes a long time to shift its direction. So what do you do instead? You look at smaller proof of concepts. And this is probably one of the easiest ways to start getting, uh, you know, a, a true transformative impact for your business. So I'll, let me use an example. If I'm consulting a marketing team and I'm telling them, hey, you've got all these different functions that are being done right now by your team. Some of them are more monotonous than others and some of them are more creative. Humans by their very nature are very creative beings and they like being creative. So let's look at the monotonous things. Let's look at the areas that are giving them frustration. You know, a classic example that I like to use is what is your podcast strategy right now? You know, using the meta example of the podcast, you're probably getting some transcription. Well, rather than having a team member do that transcription, could you use a tool like Descript AI, which would automatically give you a very solid foundation of that transcription, could even turn that transcription into multiple blog posts, multiple social posts. So you can see that it's the true area of AI and the human interacting. Now, that is a small proof of concept, and that starts getting people's wheels turning. People then start thinking, okay, what else could I do? You, switching gears to another area that I know very dearly is development. You know, we're already seeing software developers finding ways to use tools like GitHub's Copilot. It doesn't do all the coding for you. You still need a person to build the blocks, put all the features together into a single software solution, and that then will be the transformation. But suddenly, little bits, when perhaps maybe a developer had to spend 30, 60 minutes Googling what was the best way to construct a login screen, suddenly an AI tool was giving them suggestions in one to two minutes, right? Those are the types of productivity because like you say, Anatoly, more often than not, why does money get wasted when it comes to digital transformation? It's usually because people stay stuck up in the clouds of their like grand big picture vision and forget that, hey, you still need to implement actual steps to get to yeah. that. And it's much easier to break that down into those chunks to eventually get to a result that is truly transformative rather than trying to do it all in one go because naturally humans will not handle that that's too much mental fatigue it just in leads inevitably to that analysis paralysis and inevitably things don't get done yeah nice nice yeah i agree completely agree because you know for example uh, uh, i shared uh, a lot of audits with my clients and uh, once I asked one client uh, what he has done for a week, and he told me I fixed uh, he fixed uh, alt text uh, in uh, pages about us contact. <laughs> I, <laughs> that was not priority, you know. <laughs> that was far away from priority, and I got it. I don't need to share anything, anything uh, related that uh, about. Uh, far away from priority, you know, we can ignore something. It's better to uh, share uh, more important necessity things than uh, everything, you know. And you mentioned about AI and creativity. It's interesting because two elements are separate to each other, you know, according to many experts. And uh, I used AI before ChatGPT. Right now I can think that, yeah, I use a lot more AI. 
Uh, and uh, uh, I see when people complain that uh, AI is not creative, you know, just generic stuff. And I, uh, yeah, uh, I can agree because AI is the best re rewriting tool ever. Rewriting, <laughs> not copywriting, you know. Okay, AI can uh, create content from existing content, but customers, people, users probably uh, have seen this content. Now, uh, it's the same like, uh, for, <clears throat> for example, I often ask my friends about a new movie. And the most common reply, nothing special. <laughs> I saw many the same movies. Can you tell how to unite AI and creativity? Because without creativity, it's impossible to achieve anything in marketing. Any tips about that? Yeah, I think this is the, the fallacy that a lot of people are going into. And this, to be fair, AI is the latest iteration that the technology industry has spat out, right? Mm -hmm. we, we talked about this before. The technology has this awful habit of creating hype cycles around different technology. You know, previous years, it was blockchain and crypto. Before that, there was, you know, the power of social. Then there was ABM, you know, all these different flavors of the month. And right now it's AI. And quickly, everyone always looks at, oh, can AI do everything for me rather than thinking, how does it complement me? Because you're exactly right. By definition, most of the tools that we're seeing, you know, chat GPT being the most notable, are trained on the past. And so while it is really good at processing data, processing large amounts of data, which I would argue humans are not good at creating that level of data-driven pattern recognition. Like that is something a machine is going to be better at. But what is a human better at? Coming up with truly original thought, being able to analyze the environment around them and come up with a totally new to the world concept. And that's the thing that people should be looking at. Don't look at AI to generate the ideas for you. You should be doing that process. But once you have an idea, then AI can help you scaffold it out into a format. Because as we know, all humans have lots of ideas and ideas are a dime a dozen. But where the true success comes for a human is executing that idea all the way through. So if you can come up with an idea, then AI might help you turn it into a piece of content. That content could be distributed, whether it's video form, text form, image form, you could be distributing it on social. You could be distributing it on community through Discord, like Web3. You could be distributing it through your own newsletter. Whichever the format, all those different areas have mundane components that we often resist. We have internal resistance to them. AI can help us overcome that resistance. But we shouldn't be relying on AI to come up with the original idea in the first place. Because as you said, it's going to just spit out something that is based on things in the past. Now, what do I mean by this? Let me give you a very direct example. Outsourcing is the niche that I have been in my entire life. And early on, when a lot of these tools were starting to get hyped, I put in uh, just a couple of prompts, you know, tell me a little bit about the best benefits of outsourcing. And immediately, everything it spat back out it was all cost, cost, cost. And that was interesting to me because to me, that is not the best benefit. As someone who's been in this space, I have seen the best benefit of outsourcing is getting the best possible talent regardless of location. But of course, none of these language models could tell me that because it was all learning from previous write-ups from other people that all said cost, cost, cost. So of course, mm -hmm. I'm able to come up with that original idea. Now, when I put it into longer form, white papers, books, social posts, all the rest of it, I'm able to use the AI to augment that idea. But that original idea, of the best benefit of outsourcing is not cost. That was all my brain. That had to be my brain because it couldn't have come from AI. Mm -hmm. You know, you remind me interesting quote about uh implementation and ideas uh, uh i don't remember exactly how uh, this quote but it's like uh great ideas can be destroyed by mediocre team and great team 
can uh, flourish uh, mediocre ideas. <laughs> so let's unite uh, ideas and execution. You mentioned a few times execution. And I know it's hard, especially if you are talking about creating high quality content. You know, the last time I found that um, not almost everyone, all, all writers use AI, all writers. Uh, I don't know anyone who can ignore this tool. Uh, great offers who can write for Forbes, Bloomberg, many other websites, because I usually cooperate with clients on these niches. And I found all of them use uh, ChatGPT or related tools. And we usually speak to them, discuss, please don't do it. Because, okay, even if you can use it smart, it doesn't mean that we, uh, we need this content. We need something new, unique, AI can't. So can you tell about how to find offers and tell them about creating high quality content, uh, even more about texting, text writing, because writing is the foundation of uh, content. And uh, yeah, uh, how to give them the right task to, to do it because everyone can use AI to generate this uh, generic text that great grammar, but I don't need great grammar. I need something new and valuable. Any tips about that? Well, this kind of comes to my big thesis with what mm -hmm. AI is going to do. It's going to create a surge of content and then it's going to destroy content. And what do I mean by that? Right now, we're still in the early adopter phase. You know, yes, people like you and me are talking about it. There are still a lot of people that maybe they've heard it in a couple of, you know, press articles, but honestly, they're continuing their day, you know, the same as they always were. Very quickly, we're going to reach a place where, like you say, a bunch of people will have put out in a misguided fashion a bunch of content that you know, it's all fairly generic. It's all spun from the same learning models. And I think we as a species are quickly going to reject a lot of that. Because as you say, I don't care that it's written with nice grammar. I need something insightful. I need something I can use. I need something that provides me with utility. And this, I think, comes back to key industry expertise, key domain authority where the people who are going to win are the people who already have enormous amounts of specialized knowledge around a particular space, but they use AI to distribute even more or distribute even faster because that naturally does not change in us. Like as much as we see technology shifts happen over and over again, the human psychology is still the same foundational yeah. as when we were 10,000 years ago on the plains. Like we in evolutionary time scales do not change that much. And so we're going to look to places we can trust. We're going to look to even more so be more skeptical of what we see online. You can already, you know, we go back to the late 90s and the early 2000s, something that many of our parents might have told us things along the lines of you can't trust what you read on the internet. Well, that is going to be even more so where people are going to look very rigorously at what is the source of this material? Who is this person who's writing it? What are their background? What is their credentials? Do I actually listen to this person or have they just used a couple of tools to spit out something generic that's not actually true? That I think is critical. So if I'm looking at this landscape and i'm a long-term thinker i'm not looking how can i quickly produce you know 20 pages of content around an industry i know nothing about because i'm going to have that web property that website that business that's going to be slaughtered in like four months max so instead i should be looking at what do i already know and i truly believe this i truly believe that every human has a unique experience and a unique expertise that they can bring to the world. So what is that about you? I encourage every audience member to think about this for themselves. What is that unique part of yourself that you can bring to light? Because if you can use AI to double, triple, 
quadruple the output in an intelligent way, that's where you're going to see the big win. Yeah, nice, nice. Love it, love it. You remind me a story about Lloyd Richardson. Uh, I don't know if you know about the story. Uh, uh, a book offer published book uh, 11 years ago, and he couldn't sell this book for 11 years. So he tried marketing, sales, nothing worked. Then his daughter posted content on TikTok about this book from account with zero followers. This video became viral, uh, plus 50 million watch this video. And today this book is bestseller on Amazon. <laughs> you know, uh, of course I watched this video because I'm curious how to uh, earn a lot of views, million views uh, and to sell. Um, uh, I didn't find great design. No, simple design. But that was, you know, uh, she shared a story about his dad in short video that his dad spent 14 years to write a book, and uh, but uh, his dad doesn't know anything about TikTok. <laughs> so, and uh, uh, by uh, creating this video, filming this video, uh, people are curious, what kind of book is this? Uh, when author spent 14 years to write this book, that's why it's bestseller on Amazon. Uh, it's creative. It's really creative, you know, to earn all this views, uh, to beat sales methods, marketing methods. And you mentioned a few times about creativity. Can you tell how to be creative, how to uh, implement ideas in creative way? Of, of course, AI can help. It can help. But uh, in the end, manual job to provide this creativity. Any tips about that? Yeah, the funny thing is, and this is going to sound really everyday, really mundane, but it is the key way of uh, unlocking creativity that I have found. And it's about changing your environment and changing your environment very deliberately. Mm -hmm. So in my house, I have four separate places that I can work from at any given point in time. I have the seat that I'm in right now, I have a standing desk. I have an island table and I also have another um, you know, dining room table. And the, it sounds idiotic in many ways, <laughs> but the irony is when you change your environment, even just periodically doing it through the day, you allow your brain synapses to just fire in a slightly different way. Because many people know the effect of you know, shower thoughts, or I, you know, I just came up with something when I was on a walk or things like that. That happens because you disrupt your own thinking. This is a big problem that we have in the traditional corporate world where offices were expected, where you go, you sit at one desk and you sit at that same desk for eight hours a day. That does not lead to creativity. Why? because humans get stuck in a rut. They get stuck in a habit. Like there's this idea in physics of inertia and how to, you know, that energy is going to stay at a, a fairly constant rate over time. That's what happens to humans. If you change something about yourself, even something as little as your location, suddenly you're able to get more of those creative ideas. Now, the key here, is don't force it don't like you can find other ways you can talk to tools you can talk to people you can brainstorm the, all the different methods to generate the ideas my number one thing here just have a little uh note on your phone that you can always add to because when you have the idea you're not going to know when or where it's going to happen but you will regret it if you don't write it down just always write it down i do this especially with you know, video content is what I'm obsessed about making at the moment. And so naturally, you know, we can all run into, you know, writer's block, especially ironically, when we sit down to come up with ideas. Better to always be open to the new idea that might come to your head because you never know where inspiration may strike and then you write it down. But changing the environment, you know, if you're feeling stuck, if you're getting through a day and like, you know what, I spent two hours on this 
blog posts and I'm not getting anywhere and I've tried to augment with AI and I'm not liking the output there, just go for a 10 minute walk around the block. You would be surprised at how something that seems so simple, seems so insignificant, can be the biggest driver of your own creativity. Because at the end of the day, all humans are, are the sum of their experiences. If you change enough of your environment, have more experiences, you will have more inspiration, more things to draw upon in order to drive your own creativity. Nice. Yeah, valuable. Uh, I think Bill Gates uses the same method. He always uh, uh, changes environment. He talked about that. And uh, the same point uh, I read in book Atomic Habits. But he highlighted about changing environments to create good habits. You know, for example, if you have problem to destroy your bad habits and create new ones, yeah, if you change environment, you can do it. It's simple way to do it. <laughs> yeah, love it, love it, awesome. Uh, I'm interested about creating the process. You know, for example, uh, my process of creating content uh, depends on people. Uh, on this process because uh, I found uh, if you cooperate with mediocre experts, specialists, uh, so self-proclaimed specialists, it's hard. It's hard to get any result. That's why I usually prefer to create less but quality to cooperate with the best. You know. uh, can you tell about management, how to manage a team of people? Because, for example, for creating uh, just one article, uh, I have SEO specialist. Um, writer, designer, editor, content manager, web developer. Uh, so like six people can help me to create just one article. But I know it's important to create this quality. Ten years ago, I didn't care about that. One people, one man can do it everything. You know, he uh, wrote text, uh, submitted, Google ranked, even uh, this man uh, could create links, you know, to, just to buy them. No, uh, today, uh, of course, it, it, it's a, uh, another process. Can you tell about management and discipline? How to manage many people and uh, to be disciplined in the process? Yeah, absolutely. I think what you're saying is very important when it comes to the, the quality of the output, first and foremost, because the fact of the matter is, we as humans are bombarded with so many different types of content, different types of messaging. And so the only things that will stick out are the highest quality. And I know a lot of people say that, but realistically, when you look at it, you know bad content when you see it and you need it to be the highest. So how do you get that? You've got a couple of different considerations here. And the way I like to think about it is for my internal staff member that is responsible for this, I am making them the brand advocate, right? Because as much as content is important, it doesn't matter, you know, if I'm running a tech consultancy, there's no point in me having my content person produce an article about, you know, 10 tips to lose weight. It's just not relevant to our brand and it's not going to add any value to it. And we know the issues of fragmentation. So that's the first step. I want to make sure that that content person is a brand advocate, making sure that whatever gets put together fits both the style guidelines, fits the, the thesis of what we're trying to communicate to our outside audience. And that's always a key component to how I hire marketers. I'm always making sure that they're going to advocate for the customer internally. That's how all marketing teams should be set up. Beyond that, this is where you start tapping outside experts for this specific topic. So what does that look like? Obviously, as you mentioned, if I'm looking at SEO as going to be the distribution channel, this is where I get an SEO expert. And I don't need that expert to be related to our brand or our industry. I'm looking more at what are the results they have achieved with both technical and content implementation. So in this case, I hired a consultant who had taken a site from 500,000 in revenue to 10 million in revenue, purely off SEO. So it didn't matter that he didn't know our space. I knew that he understood 
the game of Google. So that's the next piece. The next piece is, as we can imagine, there is a visual and an audio visual component, particularly these days in a lot of content. So I'm looking at, are there particular video experts that I can loop in to that uh, content manager who is making, you know, managing it from end to end as the brand advocate, who can augment, who can turn the piece into a piece of interesting video content. But finally, this is the most important part. And I'm alluding to exactly what you talked about, about quality and expertise. More often than not, everyone commits the cardinal sin with content of they try and just hire a direct copywriter. And that's not the best way to do it because a copywriter will usually have a certain amount of habits. They'll have grammar skills. They'll have linguistic skills. But ultimately, what makes a piece of content resonate with an audience? It's when the audience can see themselves, their problem in the content. And this is why I hire outside experts who are self-confessed non-writers. And I prefer to interview them. That's where I can take my content manager, who is that brand advocate, to interview that person for their insights. Classic example of this. I was writing some business formation content for my side venture that I mentioned last time on the show, Nano Globals. And naturally it's about legal entities. Like I'm not a lawyer, I never went to law school. So I hired a, a lawyer from the EU because this content was specifically EU focus. And I asked him a series of questions about the right services to go to, how to set up your business, you know, what were the different considerations to think about whether you're at a small entrepreneur scale, a mid-sized company, all of that then can be packaged into a piece of content that I know is going to be the highest quality because it's from someone who is an actual expert, as opposed to a copywriter who, what is a copywriter going to do? They're going to go and research. They're probably going to search on Google. All the content they're going to get on Google is simply other stuff that's ranked well. So whether it's true or not is, you know, depends. But when you do that strategy, then you're actually getting to what you're talking about, Anatoly. It's not about pumping out 10 pieces of content that are mediocre. You could do that. Early 2000s, you could pump out stuff that, you know, it wasn't great, but like, hey, where else were people going to go? The library? No. But in these day and age where everyone is super connected online, you know, you don't really have a choice. You know, B rank content isn't going to cut it anymore. You're going to need A class content. The only way you get there is yes, you need to have the marketers. You need to have the team members who understand how to format it correctly, how to write hooks, how to, you know, create intrigue, all of those psychological elements, but the foundation, you still need an expert for it. Nice. Yeah. I agree. I agree. I, yeah, Google fired a team of copywriters that I had in some time. <laughs> okay, I did it, I did it, but Google helped me to do it. <laughs> so, yeah, and today we have a team of editors who can help to edit this uh, content. And, um, yeah, I prefer to cooperate with experts, but I usually search for experience. Uh, I mean, like, for, uh, for experts who can write, because I found if experts don't write it's hard to get high quality text from them but if they have experience to write and know the topic uh, i usually check out if they write only about one topic so if they write about crypto finance investing okay we can cooperate but if they write about weight loss finance no way <laughs> i'm not sure that we can cooperate so when i get requests ah i can write about everything any topics please stop writing me i'm not interested to know more about topics that you can cover okay patrick i, I have one more hack i have one more hack here so if you are writing for a technical audience 
many people know about software developers and unfortunately the amount of burnout that software developers face is quite mm -hmm. rampant. There are a lot of developers who will be burnt out, quit for a while, go on a sabbatical and usually pick up writing about technical topics as a way to find their feet. They're often in strange places of the world. They're often like digital nomads. I picked up a couple from Mexico City. One was in Colombia. Those are some of the best writers you can ever get for technical content because they know their space inside and out. They also haven't quite figured out what they're doing next. So they, they're often very affordable. Best tip for that. <laughs> nice, nice, great. Patrick, you mentioned about video content. So you pay attention to a few videos and um, I found another trap with uh, this type of content because many people copy influencers, for example, on TikTok, uh, on YouTube, it doesn't matter. Just uh, try to replicate existing content. Uh, it's not a good idea. I don't like it. It's better to consider uh, your own strong side. And can you tell how you film videos, what kind of goal you have, and what is the main difference, uh, how you stand out from the rest uh, in your video content? So with my video content, and I must confess, like I was never a video guy from, from the get-go. I was completely a writer first and foremost. It was something I had to learn. But like you, I immediately saw two paths. Uh, and I was starting on some of the short form platforms like YouTube shorts. I was starting with some reels. I was starting with some TikTok. And I quickly realized I have two options here. I can either constantly chase what people are talking about online, talking about the trends and see if I can hijack some of the views, or I can chart a path based on my own personal message and what I'm trying to get across. Now, the first strategy is useful to get quick wins. I'm not going to deny that. But I deliberately chose not to do that because what I immediately realized is this isn't going to be sustainable. You're going to constantly race. You might be able to do it for three months, six months. If you're, if you're really strong-willed, you could do it for two years. But at the end of the day, you're not going to have built a true audience. You're going to have built some numbers, but no one who actually gives a damn about you. And that was why I chose the second approach. And I knew this deliberately as I picked it that, hey, outsourcing is still a fairly opaque industry. A lot of people aren't always searching about it. Even most people only face the problem that involves employing someone that provides outsourcing services when they finally reach that problem. It's not something that most people are thinking about in their day to day. And I accepted that. And the reason I accepted that is because as I was constructing my videos, I was starting to see, hey, are people flowing through to my website? Are people like looking at other forms of content? Because I much more care about a hundred people who are going to be relevant to what I'm talking about than just getting 10,000 vanity views that are going to disappear as they scroll through to the next thing. Now, this is not to say you give yourself an excuse. And that was something I was acutely aware of. I started learning things about what is my audience retention metric? Where do people start dropping off from my videos? Can I incorporate humor? Can I incorporate memes? Can I find ways to keep people's attention that might not necessarily always be interested in what is a dry, boring subject? Because that's what I quickly saw. When I started creating videos in the outsourcing space, most people did the exact same thing. They just did talking straight to camera, blank background, nothing else, no interesting sounds, no interesting effects, and again, I'm not a video editor. I, I had to learn a lot of that as well with the tools. But suddenly what I'm starting to pick up on is what stuff resonates? What gets people to click through to another video and another video? What gets that intrigue going? Yeah. That I think is the critical component when you think about creating video. Because 
at the end of the day, even with all these tools, video is still a challenging medium, right? It is a lot harder to do. And I say this full in the knowledge that there are a bunch of gurus out there that just go, just create a faceless channel, make it with automation, use an AI voice. Why would I do that? That can get disrupted by two, three, five, ten people the next day. But if I create using myself, using the trust that an audience can have in me as a person, that is an incredible moat. That is an, a barrier to entry that is quite significant. And that is my thesis. So again, I encourage if you are going to start creating videos, don't look at the trend. Look at what is your defensible ground? What is the expertise that you can share 10 videos, 20 videos, 100 videos? What can you keep talking about over and over and over again? Because it's so innate to your being, that is what you should create video content around. And then from there, you don't have to do all the editing yourself. You can go to Fiverr if you want to find affordable video editors. You can use certain services that charge monthly retainers. You've even got many different AI tools that are coming out rapidly to help bring down the barriers of entry when it comes to the editing process. Because this still comes back to the same thing we were talking about before. The creative aspect, the idea aspect should be you. Lean on other tools and other methods in order to get it fully through to completion. Nice, nice. Love it, love it. Yeah, great tips. Uh, I remember when Mr. Beast shared his tips, how he learned YouTube. And yeah, he didn't learn uh, algorithms, uh, but he learned why people watch, why people engage, <laughs> what, what kind of uh, things people don't like, why they bounce videos. And uh, after he got like thousand subscribers after an year and a half. So he spent so much time to get first thousand subscribers. But I found that uh, great video content creators uh, enjoy the process. So they never give up because they enjoy it. They don't care about, re of course, they want the results. But if they don't see results, they can go ahead because life the process. For example, I love uh, playing basketball. Nobody pays me, <laughs> you know, but uh, it's my habit. I love it. I enjoy the process. So I can do it every single day if I have time, of course. But uh, uh, it's the same with video content. You need to love it. You need to love to do. And uh, another channel that I like, uh, uh, the name of channel Anatoly. Like my name, but in the end, why? Uh, instead of I, I. And uh, I know this guy. It's interesting that he got uh, plus 1 million 200 uh, thousand followers uh, in five months. But it's interesting. Uh, it's, uh, it's his second channel. So uh, he had a Russian channel uh, where he filmed pranks. And uh, he couldn't get results for a long time. And I found uh, he loved, uh, you know, he loves uh, uh, to create these pranks. But the first videos were so bad. You can't even compare with existing videos. He, uh, he enjoyed the process. He, uh, when he uh, launched the second channel, right now, I think he's a star, you know, to get a lot of uh, subscribers. Uh, I love all his content. I can watch all the time, you know, because it's funny. It's interesting, you know, to watch these pranks. Uh, Patrick, my f I have two questions left, you know, for you. Uh, my first question about uh, your experience. Uh, I have students in my network who are looking for ways how to learn. You replied to this question in my first uh, podcast, but uh, I have new listeners. So can you tell, uh, if you started today from scratch, what will you do today to learn more about marketing? So I think the thing, if, I, if you'd asked me this question when I first started, I would have said, get a psychology, either get a diploma, get a, a major in it, something of that nature. While I still think that's true, I recognize that right at this point in time, 
especially given how marketing has shifted, is that there often isn't the time to learn. You know, you look at people coming out of college degrees, getting blown away by people who've taken short six month courses. Instead, I would argue best of both worlds. And I would allude to the previous thing, video. The one thing that I realized even myself as a very seasoned marketer, been in this industry for over 10 years now, is that video was bringing up all of those old concepts that I'd learned back in my major of psychology. They were bringing up how do I, you know, tap into people's desires, people's wants, how do I communicate, how do I persuade, all of these components. And so it's giving me a real life, real time education. And that's the number one thing I would say, because the fact of the matter is, it is still the number one fear. The number one fear of everyone is public speaking, whether it's public speaking on stage or public speaking in the internet world of speaking on video, speaking on camera it is a tough thing. And like you said, people will cringe. They will cringe at the first videos they make. They'll be like, oh, this is awful. Why are they cringing? Because what they wanted it to be in their heads is not where it is. It's significantly lower. But that process, I think if you're a marketer starting today, if you're, you know, coming to the end of high school, if you're, you know, end of your college degree, deciding what to do, learn video because video will give you the fastest feedback loop as to what people like and what people dislike. And by doing that, you will always be a good marketer because marketers chase, they chase every newfangled thing, right? Every marketer last year chased crypto. Every marketer this year is chasing AI. If 5G comes back next year, they'll all be chasing that as well. And you have to stop because if you're going to have a sustainable, successful career, not just in marketing, but really in anything that you do, you need to build your career on a foundation of principles. And so that's why I would say, yes, you are right. The world's getting faster. Things are moving quicker. So maybe you don't have the time to spend on years of education. So why not get a real life education? Learn video, inspect video, and through that, you will become a really great marketer. Nice, nice. So valuable. I agree. Practice is more important than learning. Once someone asked me if I listen all your podcast episodes, can I become a great marketer? I replied, no, you can't. It's impossible. It, it, it doesn't matter how many books you can read, uh, blog posts, uh, watch videos. It's more about implementation, about practice. You know, uh, Cristiano Ronaldo prefers to hit the ball a thousand times than <laughs> read a few books how to play soccer, you know, because it's practice. And uh, of course, we need to learn to get ideas and then to think how to implement them. And you mentioned on in our podcast that people are the same. I agree. You know, like uh, my loving book uh, written by Jack London 100 years ago, Martin Eden, about a guy who didn't have any education. Then with consistency, he overcame all great offers in his time uh, because of loving the process of consistency of doing something. And um, the second book that, that I can recommend from Joe Sugarman, he wrote this book uh, 50 years ago about uh, creating a marketing message. Uh, he was great about that. And uh, yeah, I think, you know, uh, all his points were about marketing, but I can relate them to SEO, to digital marketing, because people are the same. Technologies change, not people. <laughs> so we need to think how to adapt technologies to human psychology. I completely agree with you. And Patrick, my final question about the future. I can't avoid this question uh, because many things are coming, uh, changing our environment uh, uh, with these technologies. Uh, AI uh, was simple to ignore, hard today, impossible tomorrow. So 
any tips or suggestion what kind of future will be and how to adapt today to this possible future so this funnily enough doesn't change and i've said this from the start of my career and i will still continue to say it because whether it's ai whether it's automation whether it's uh, you know, a global pandemic whether it's war like you cannot avoid crisis like that has punctuated the entire existence of humanity i think people have gotten used to a post world war 2 environment but i think many people look at it nostalgically they forget there was an oil crisis in the 70s they forget there were issues of like the vietnam war that was particularly pertinent to the united states there was the korean war before that you know there's been obviously ukraine which has been the most pertinent now the whole internet has come out you can never avoid the steady march of both opportunities that provide with technology and crises that is a part of it but what you can control is understanding humans and this is one of my biggest hacks for understanding humans look to history look to behaviors look to the innate of what it means to be human because yes there will be changes that you'll need to adapt to but if you can understand the few constants that is where your key to success lies i don't even think i will be a marketer by the time my career ends i foresee a world where each person in an organization takes on the role of marketing and marketing ceases to be an independent function because every business needs it and i can't change that but yeah. what i can do is focus on those core elements can i understand why a human does what they do can i understand why they buy can i understand why they meet their needs in a certain way and if i can understand that then i always have something to do i think the world and particularly businesses are not that complicated they like to pretend they're complicated but they come down to two things can you build something can you sell something i'm very much in the latter camp because i'm a marketer but i also build as we talked about last time i had something from zero you know again it can be very hard to start something but i sat down with a business partner and together we built nano globals you know last time i came on your show it was at 60,000 monthly visitors. Now it's at 80,000 monthly visitors. You know, nice. we continue to grow. So you do one or two things. You build or you sell. And how do you do that? You understand humans. Because at the end of the day, yes, AI is the the threat of the now. Does AI buy? No. And until AI buys, you're stuck with humans. So if you're stuck with humans, understand us, understand our species. We're not that different. We like to pretend we are. We like to pretend that we are so much more advanced than, you know, the ancient uh, Egyptians. No, we're the same people. We're the same desires, the same wants, the same needs. We all want to do good work, provide for our families and live a good life. That doesn't change. Understand that you'll be very successful no matter what you do. Nice, nice. Golden words. Love it. Love it. Awesome. Yeah, I agree. You know, even in my experience, I stopped reading news about Ukraine. It's my country. I have business there. But I found if I spend time to read this news, it impacts my well being. Uh, then I can't be productive in my job. But if I pay attention to my job, I can earn more money and to donate to Ukraine, uh, to Ukrainian people, to Ukrainian army. And it's more helpful than to discuss with anybody else about this terrible time. Of course, it's terrible. But if you want to help more, then work more and help more, you know. So, yeah, I yeah, I love it. Love it. Awesome. Yeah good achievements 
Patrick, it's a big pleasure to get in my show to learn from you. Tell our audience the best way how to keep learning from you, how to reach out to you, how to follow you. Yep. So the easiest way you can either subscribe to Nano Globals on YouTube. So youtube.com slash at Nano Globals, or you can connect with me on LinkedIn, linkedin.com slash IN slash Patrick James Ward or one word. Okay, guys, you can find the link to YouTube channel and LinkedIn profile in the description below. Listen us on Apple, Google, Spotify. Thanks again for your time. Love it. So valuable. Guys, I recommend to anyone to follow Patrick on LinkedIn and subscribe to his channel because you can see a lot of value. Okay, love you. See you.